photograph several keyboards in this presentation. One is, or two are, voice and exit, and another one is social capital. So I probably have to explain what I mean by all of those. Uh, first, uh, excuse me. <laughs> first, uh, uh, about social capital. Uh, I mentioned yesterday, and maybe most of the people here have heard that expression before, but just uh, to be sure that we understand each other, social capital is generally understood as, as the capacity for collective action. When there is a common problem that people face, a common goal that they want to pursue, they need to be able to cooperate to achieve that. And that cooperation is not given for granted. In some communities, some societies, some countries, people are more able to cooperate with each other, to pull resources, to contribute efforts, money, what else, to do something together jointly. And uh, that capacity depends on a number of traits, such as trust, uh, norms, values, uh, communication in the society, and so on. And in some of the cases, this capacity is less pronounced. Uh, a few more words about social capital so that we understand what will follow. Uh, social capital and governments uh, serve similar purposes. Governments are required in our life uh, to enforce cooperation and coordination. Uh, if people act unilaterally, if people do not take into account consequences of their actions for the rest of the society, then you're going to have lots of market failures. And these market failures are known as externalities, as insufficient provision of public goods, uh, so on and, uh, uh, and, and, and so forth. And this is why governments enforce coordination. They levy taxes which are mandatory, and taxes go towards uh, provision of public goods, because if public goods such as police, armed forces, uh, transport, public transit, infrastructure, so on and so forth, if they are funded by individual donations, then usually the amount of such public goods will be insufficient and will be far less than what is socially optimal. But on the other hand, if people can organize their life together and uh, solve problems in their life jointly, they probably need less government in their life. So that's uh, a very general perception that social capital and governments are substitutes. In a society where you have lots of social capital, where people respect each other, where they trust each other, where they can join together, work together for a common good, you probably need less government. And that doesn't seem to be the case. That intuition does not hold. Because uh, the countries and societies with the highest level of social capital, and these are Scandinavian countries, this also countries and societies which have biggest governments in the world, if you measure the government as a percentage of state budget and the GDP. So Sweden, Norway, Finland are societies with a high level of trust, with plenty of social capital, and also with big governments. And that suggests that social capital and governments are not necessarily just substitutes. Sometimes they're complements. And they're complements in the sense that uh, to have a government working effectively, you need a special type of social capital that would hold governments accountable. Uh, government's accountability is not a given. Even if you have a democratic system, the jury, uh, democracy could be shallow, democracy could be manipulated, could be captured, could be trivialized. And this is simply because people cannot take advantage of the opportunities and institutions that democracy provides. People have to be politically active, people have to be politically engaged. And uh, it requires voting, it requires political awareness, it requires what is known as civic culture. And this is something which I mentioned yesterday. Civic so culture can be understood as people's sense of belonging to social life, people's sense of possibility and opportunity to affect public affairs, uh, people's confidence that they can do it, and also the sense of public duty that uh, the conditions <coughs> of your town, of your region, of your country is something that you're responsible for, and you can influence that. So this is what civic culture is called. And if there is enough of civic culture in the society, then our governments in such societies are usually efficient, accountable, they perform uh, well. And if there is a lack of civic culture, then governments are usually corrupt, inaccountable. Uh, and even if 
these governments and political systems are nominally democratic, in fact, elites capture political life and, uh, and misuse uh, uh, public institutions for their own sake and the expense of society. So one thing that I want you to remember from this brief introduction is that social capital is something that solves uh, the collective action problem. And if you can uh, tackle different types of collective action problem, one is in your private life, when you do something without involving government, another collective action problem is to hold government accountable. And uh, government accountability is in itself a major public good for the society. And unless there is a sufficient political participation on the side of the society, which is also collective action of special type, you won't have good governments. <coughs> so governments and uh, social capital are not just simply substitutes, they're also complements. Then another thing, <coughs> another part of this brief introduction is of course about voice and exit. And that comes all the way to the famous 1970 book of, of the American political scientist Albert Hirschman, uh, which is titled Voice, Exit and Loyalty. And the nutshell of this book, Hirschman is a very well-known scholar, but he was, he recently passed away. He was a scholar <coughs> of one book. If you ask anyone from Hirschman, then of course, uh, voice and exit will come immediately back and little else. <coughs> so, but that was a very powerful piece of writing and uh, what Hirschman essentially argued was that uh, if someone uh, has, faces problems in his life, mm -hmm. And these problems could occur in his organization, such as her, uh, the university or whatnot, or in his region, his city, for goodness sake, in his country. Uh, there are several ways to respond to these problems. Uh, and the first one would be to raise voice, which means to do something, to address this problem and hopefully to solve it. And another one, an alternative <coughs> to voice would be to exit. And exit is simply to leave this problem alone and, you know, to, to almost literally exit. If, if you're not satisfied with, your, with what is happening at your department, then hopefully you'll find another university to work at. Or you, you, suppose you feel that you're discriminated at your workplace, then you will change a job or will change an occupation or whatnot if you're not happy with how your, uh, how your city is governed or how your region is governed, then you move to another city. And, and in fact, this substitution between voice and exit is, uh, is quite well known, although it was not made as explicit as Hirschman did. For example, Charles T. Boo, uh, an American economist who is famous for his theory of federalism, uh, emphasized precisely that. He said that one important advantage of federal state with decentralized governments is that in such state, people can vote with their feet. Uh, in addition to conventional political institutions and conventional democracy, uh, opportunities such as voting with your votes, with your ballots, with your hands, you can also vote with your feet in that if you do not like what is happening in that particular state or municipality or county or whatnot, if you're not happy with <coughs> from George's County, you go to Montgomery County, or you, there are opportunities to move about and that uh, that's a, that's. Uh, specific type of exit and voice as alternatives. Uh, now, uh, people, uh, if you think about voice, uh, <coughs> voice uh, to be heard, voice has to be collective. A single voice is hardly going to make any difference. So, uh, uh, when you think about voice, you think about something which is public. When you think about exit, you think about something which is entirely private. You exit privately, you leave. You leave uh, a university, you leave a city, you leave a country, you immigrate, and this is what, unfortunately, many <laughs> Russians do these days. But I would like to emphasize that voice and exit can both be public, and they are alternatives to each other, and they require different types of social capital to power these responses. And what this presentation is about, suppose that people have <coughs> a problem in their life, and suppose that governments have something to do with this problem to emerge. Uh, suppose that there is a lack of public infrastructure. Or suppose that you're not satisfied with the uh, business environment in your city or in your region or whatnot. So government bears a good deal of responsibility for what is happening. 
And there are two ways to respond for uh, a society to these governance failures. One is voice, and that means to become politically engaged, to become politically active, to demand better performance from public officials, to demand for to demand more bang for your pocket, so to say. And another one is to assume that there is very little you can do about the government. Uh, government is far and above, uh, it's out of reach, and the political system is such that it doesn't allow you to, uh, to be politically involved. You take it as a given. And then you come up with private substitutes for uh, government's level of performance. But these private substitutes are also collective. Uh, in that, suppose that uh, a local government uh, does not provide enough of particular public service. So people would horizontally pool their resources and complement, supply in addition to what the government, uh, to whatever little the government is doing, their own contributions privately. Uh, uh, alternatively, as I said, and, and, and again, this is a collective action, and that of course requires that people know each other, they trust each other, they can organize themselves to serve as an alternative source of uh, public services. Or suppose that uh, you're not satisfied with the official business environment and you still want to be engaged in different types of businesses. So you do, uh, you create uh, alternative arrangements for enterprise. And that is, of course, known as the informal economy, as a, uh, as a shadow economy. So informal economy is also a collective response to governance failures. It's also something that requires collaboration, coordination, something that requires trust, something that essentially requires social capital. And if you cannot rely on official institutions to conduct business, then you come up with alternative institutions, which are known as the formal economy. <coughs> and many people, by the way, marvel at how efficient uh, informal economy can be as an alternative to uh, dysfunctional uh, government, uh, official institutions. But then there are, of course, uh, very severe restrictions on what uh, informal economy can afford. And by the way, I have an interesting question to you. It's a quiz, if you like. Try your guess. Uh, countries differ from each other in the level of trust. There are countries where people trust each other more. There are countries where people, where people <coughs> trust uh, each other much less. So what kind of correlation do you think exists, exists between uh, the level of trust and the size of the informal sector? In other words, uh, in a high trust society, will you see more of informal economic activities or less of informal economic activities? And from what I said before, it appears that uh, trust should be positively correlated with the informal economy because uh, because trust allows you to conduct transactions without without relying on uh, you know official enforcement of contracts, dispute resolutions. You and in fact, there are many examples when markets are marvelously sustained by trust and high level of trust actually gives comparative advantages to uh, people uh, uh, engaged in a particular trade. Uh, one, uh, uh, one such example, uh, there was an American sociologist by the name Coleman who <coughs> uh, famously wrote about the role of trust and uh, social capital in the private sector and he took the example of diamond trade in New York. Uh, and he explained that you know, there are two or three centers of diamond trading in the world. One is New York, another one is Johannesburg, South Africa. And I think that's just about it. The, there is a little bit of, pardon me? Antwerp. Oh, yes, right. You, right, you are, right. A little bit in Armenia, by the way, not much, but some. So why New York? Why New York is so prominent in uh, uh, diamond trading? Coleman explains that uh, when you trade diamonds, and we're talking, uh, uh, and we're talking about uh, uncut rough diamonds, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, the price, the value of a diamond it depends on uh, minute details. And you have to carefully examine a piece of diamond to really decide its value. And people who are in gold in that trade know that the important thing is size and cuts and, and cleanliness and whatnot. So if you if uh, Jeska wants to sell me a diamond, what he has to do is to allow me to explore that diamond very carefully. And so I have to get hold of that piece of diamond. So he have to give it to me at one point. And the value of that piece of diamond could be more than So you have to trust me. 
And if you do, then our transactions would be much smoother. And diamond trade between us would be much more efficient than it would be otherwise. So trust supports uh, economic transactions, and it supports economic transactions without any reliance on official institutions of uh, property rights, contract enforcement, dispute resolution, so on and so forth. Going back to the story of diamond traders in New York, uh, the important feature of the community of diamond traders is that all of them are Hasidic Jews, and they know each other, they belong to a close-knit group, and as a result, they trust each other, simply because uh, breaching this trust would cause enormous consequences for whoever thinks about that, and it would be prohibitively costly. And that suggests that trust and you know, uh, social capital, horizontal social capital, apolitical social capital, is something that facilitates life and economic transactions and public good provision without government. So let's get back to the question I just asked you. What do you think is the correlation? between the level of trust and the size of the informal sector. And from what I said, I was trying to, to, to bring you to a wrong answer, which is that it's positive. In fact, it's negative. It's very strongly negative. Uh, more trusting societies have much less of the informal sector. And the explanation goes as follows. If you have a high level of trust in the society, such societies are usually richly endowed with civic culture. And they use civic culture and other types of social capital to effectively hold their governments accountable. And if governments are accountable, if governments are efficient, then uh, they maintain a healthy uh, business environment. They maintain, they maintain uh, uh, not particular burdens of regulation. They provide public goods and services. And as a result, people simply do not need a formal economy. They're very comfortable. They're very satisfied with the formal sector. So all of this illustrates very clearly, I think, uh, that uh, social capital is not just a simple replacement of government. Social capital is something which is really required to have an efficient government. And maybe the final piece of introduction to this small uh, presentation would be to tell about the so-called paradox of social capital. And this is something that was first discovered by uh, Robert Putnam in his famous book, Make Democracy Work. And it's the first big study on social capital, and it was a study on an essential and natural experiment that took place in Italy, where a country was uh, pulled together from different pieces by Garibaldi in the late 19th century, and what is now parts of, uh, of the Italian state are regions and uh, societies with very different history and with very different stocks of social capital. Uh, in a nutshell, in southern Italy, and this is something which I briefly mentioned yesterday, there is a dearth of social capital. People uh, do not trust each other very much, and uh, they do not have sufficient civic culture, uh, whereas in the north, uh, the level of trust is much higher, and there is plenty of civic culture. And as a result, uh, governments, especially regional governments, we're not talking about the national government, which is one for the whole country, but regional governments, provincial governments, Local governments are, of course, very different. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, provincial governments work much better in the north than in the south. And this is something which is clearly revealed by surveys. People are asked at the same time, uh, what do you think about uh, the performance of your regional government? And in the north, people would say, OK, well, you know, they're not great, and they're all sort of prone to corruption, and politicians are the same everywhere, but so on and so forth. But that's fine. We can live with that. So, you know, uh, C plus, perhaps, or maybe it'll be minus. Uh, and then when you ask the same question in the South, uh, they all oh, know your crooks, they're mafiosa, they are they're entirely corrupt, they steal our money, they, uh, so it's, uh, it's a failed, it's a failed mark. Okay, and uh, perhaps this is because people in the South are more skeptical or more demanding uh, when they assess government performance, not so, because when you ask the same question about the national government, uh, uh, marks are about the same. So they are don't differ from each other in their assessment of national government simply because the single national government, but very different, sharply different um, when they assess regional governments. But then, and when you ask people, do you think that governments should have more control over your life? And then you would imagine that, uh, or uh, I don't, I'm not sure that was the exact wording, do you think that there should be bigger presence of government in your life? Uh, and you would probably imagine that in the north, where people are more or less content with what governments do, they would say, sure, governments help. 
And in the South, where people hate governments clearly and squarely, they would say, of course not. But then the results are completely different. Uh, when you ask people, uh, do you think there should be more of government involvement in your life? In the South, people say, oh yeah, sure, 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 because you know, people around are so cruel and quiche and so, uh, so untrustworthy and so on and so forth. So without strict government control, the whole life will collapse. And in the North, where people are more or less satisfied with, life, with, with what governments do, they say, no, no, well, that's quite enough. Probably even less. We, we can do it ourselves. So, uh, there is negative correlation between the assessment of government performance on the one hand and people's demand for government's presence and control on the other, and this is what is known as the paradox of social capital. And you see clear signs and features of this paradox in, uh, in Russia as well, so quite a number of scholars reproduce that. So, uh, as we see from what I said so far, the uh, interplay between social capital and different types of social capital and the government is fairly complex. And what I would like to do now is to give you a few illustrations of how people can respond, as I said, to government's failures. And uh, so far we spoke about two types of reactions. One is voice. And voice means that people exercise their political rights. And if they're not happy with what governments do, they get politically active and uh, uh, demand better job from the government. And another option is, the so that's collective voice. And the second option would be uh, the collective action, where uh, you're not satisfied with what governments do, but you are, you're, you're not very optimistic about doing anything about your governments. So you write governments off, if you will. Uh, you do not expect much from them. And then as a result, you provide uh, substitutes uh, to non-performing governments. And this is also a collective action because it requires coordination, it requires joint efforts, it requires pooling resources, but this is an apolitical collective action. So what I want to do is to talk about uh, how valuable these two capacities are, and uh, if there are, for example, if there are two societies and one type of society prefers the political collective action to the apolitical one, and another one, vice versa, which of these societies would be more successful? So that's an attempt to answer this question, and I will start with a couple of examples, and then uh, there is a little bit of theory, but uh, no one here is an economist, so I will probably skip the theory. We'll try to give you an intuition of that theory, and then we'll proceed to the empirical part of that paper, where you survey data to, uh, to measure the payoff to these two different types of social capital, one of which is civic culture, another one is horizontal social capital, and we'll see which one is more available. Okay, so let me start with a few cases, with a few preludes, and one is, uh, uh, it's about the bridge. Sharia is not, for you gentlemen, it's not Sharia law, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a small town in Kostroma region in Russia's northwest, and uh, it's, uh, it straddles a small river which is called Sharinka, and there was uh, a bridge over that river which, uh, after many years of neglect, collapsed. Uh, this is what it is. Uh, yeah. So, and as a result, uh, uh, whatever business uh, community existed in the city or in the town of Sharia was denied vital access to the rest of the world. And uh, quite obviously, they asked the government, the local government, to fix the bridge, and they said, well, it will cost us uh, at, at the net exchange rate. Uh, several hundred thousand dollars, and we simply don't have that kind of money. <laughs> so we'll have to put it off until a few years later, and for the time being, use a detour uh, that would be something like 25 kilometers long. And the conditions of uh, the road uh, on that detour were not much better than the condition of the bridge, so that was not something that local business people <laughs> were prepared to contend with. And as a result, they fixed the bridge themselves. So it was a wonderful example of collective action. It's something that you know all of these civil society activists would applaud. Uh, uh, people on their own uh, put together resources. Resources were uh, materials, equipment, time, some money. And uh, the actual cost of repair of the bridge turned out to be, depending on how you measure it, anywhere from 500,000 rubles to 1 million rubles. And recall that the official budgeting was uh, 14 million rubles, so it was less than one-tenth of the official budget, and this is what happened. This is before, this is work in progress, 
and this is after the bridge is fixed. So apparently that uh, community in Sharia was quite successful in providing a private alternative, collective exit, if you will, for political life, and it was able to reverse <coughs> And that has become a common feature in Russia. Uh, uh, oftentimes, uh, for example, there are natural disasters, uh, fires, uh, recent fires in Hakassia, you remember these forest fires in 2010, and flooding and whatnot, landslide, uh, landslides. People would pool their resources and uh, replace governments. Uh, they wouldn't expect much from the government, so civil society volunteers would say it's incumbent upon ourselves to solve this problem. Uh, and many people said that this is what, what exactly needs to be done until, uh, at least you know, under the present conditions, uh, you cannot uh, make Russian democracy work. So forget about conventional democracy and let civil society assume the functions of the government. So that's becoming increasingly the case. Let me give you an example of the collective voice now, and that's more recent. Uh, potholes in Novosibirsk, and that's my native city, so I know it more or less firsthand. Uh, uh, roads uh, in Novosibirsk uh, are in uh, very, very bad shape, and very little is done uh, 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 yeah, about this. So uh, there is a whole lot of creativity in Novosibirsk, something that I saw firsthand. And that idea of monstrations, you probably heard about that, monstrace, uh, the birthplace of this monstration was Novosibirsk. So here's an example of a monstration in Novosibirsk. They took it to the streets, and what they did, they, uh, 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 they fetched up some of the most beautiful young girls in Novosibirsk, local models, and asked them to mimic a, a poolside or an ocean side, uh, making a, some kind of a beach. <laughs> of this uh, dysfunctional road. So you see there is a chronic pothole, lots of water, and if you can see it on the picture, oh, no, I, in the background, uh, there are, you know, there are some, some, uh, some, some uh, beautiful, scantily dressed girls. <laughs> and, and here they are even, you know, <laughs> almost swimming. <laughs> They're playing ball, uh, and, uh, and, and they're voting with their, uh, I wouldn't probably say voting with their feet, they probably vote with their legs now. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the message is clear. We are not happy about what is uh, happening, and we want to make it clear to the government. And their appeal was uh, directed primarily to the new mayor of Novosibirsk, whose name is Lockett. Uh, so, Mr. Lockett, uh, do something about this pothole. So, that's an example of somewhat exotic, but still voice. And, uh, and then, uh, as, as, as I just said, uh, these two illustrations uh, give an idea of two types of societal responses to governance failures, two types of collective action. The first one is material, grassroots, apolitical. Let's get job done. And uh, to do that, let's pull effort and resources and fix the bridge or ourselves. So for that matter, let's fix the potholes ourselves. And this is something that I know incidents of in the Far East, people give up on uh, governments, and they did what the people in Sharia did. They pulled resources. Another one is political, uh, which is uh, to join forces to demand better performance and greater transparency from the government that should be delivering value for taxpayers' money. And in both cases, we're talking about social capital, because in both cases, it's a collective action, but of different type, and it requires different types of social capital. The first one is horizontal social capital which oftentimes is confined within close-knit communities or societies of people that know each other. And the, uh, that's uh, the material. And the political one is civic culture. That is people's uh, competent use of institutions and opportunities that the democratic political system affords to make democracy work. And uh, apparently in Sharia, the capacity for collective action of the first type was much stronger than for the second one, Novosibirsk, it's less clear. Now, uh, how shall we assess the capacity to replace government when the government does not provide, when the government abuses its power, authority, and whatnot? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? To make this question somewhat sharper, uh, imagine two types of societies. Suppose that none of these societies is, uh, has enough of civic culture to ensure efficient performance of their local governments. So in both cases, there are some governance problems of roughly the same magnitude. Now, suppose, however, that in the first society, there is no capacity whatsoever to do government job privately. There is no capacity for the collective exit. 
Whereas in the second society, there is a lot of such capacity. And then the question to you would be which of these societies is better off? The one which can fix problems left unattended by the government or the one which cannot? And, uh, uh, you know, it appears that uh, you got nothing to lose by fixing this bridge, right? At the very least, you have a bridge to you, so that's kind of a good thing. Well, what we indicate, well, what our theory and what our empirical data suggests, it's not necessarily the case. And it might well be that a society that has this capacity to solve problems for the government might end up being worse off than the society that uh, cannot provide substitutes for non-performing government. And in that case, the social capital that powers up this kind of response is not this one. Uh, this one has a so-called dark side. Uh, again, yesterday I mentioned uh, dark side of social capital, so my apologies to those who heard that for me yesterday, but just a couple of words. Uh, since Putnam's work, and in fact since the work of Putnam's predecessors, social capital, but essentially, especially afterwards, was uh, commonly perceived as something which is incredibly valuable, something which is uh, very good, very useful, very helpful. It's a capital, it's a resource. And communities and societies with social capital, they're better off simply because they have access to this resource. But then, uh, even early on, people were pointing out that social capital could have dark sides. And uh, dark sides of social capital means that, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, social capital could cause problems in people's lives and could uh, make them worse off rather than making them better off. And there are several examples of social capital's dark side, especially when social capital is confined within close knit communities, in which case people pool their resources locally to compete with each other, and such competition could be wasteful. Uh, this kind of uh, social capital, and the name of the social capital, there is, uh, there is a little bit of, of slang of those who do social capital analysis, and they distinguish between so-called bridging and bonding social capital. I think this is Putnam, Putnam's terminology as well. Bridging social capital is encompassing social capital. It's social capital that straddles uh, social divides, social capital which sustains large societal coalitions for common good. Whereas bonding social capital is confined to groups who are loyal to each other, who know each other, who are needed by family bonds, by ethnicity bonds, by religious bonds, uh, by, you know, some background, we're from the same university or what else. And uh, in the case of the prevalence of bonding social capital, uh, these groups can use the social capital to compete with each other. There is, <coughs> there is a very useful distinction, especially for the purpose of this study. Uh, an economist from Stanford, institutional economist, whose name is Abner Greif, uh, and Guido de Bellini, from, uh, from which university in Italy, I don't remember, never mind. Uh, they came up recently with a series of papers where they make distinctions between what they uh, metaphorically call cities and clans, and neither city nor clan uh, should be taken literally. When you speak about cities, it's something that has some official institutions, and people who work in cities, and they are citizens, uh, they uh, have the sense of ownership of this institution, they use this institution, they support these institutions, they value these institutions. And these are uh, uh, jurisdictions, political units, cities, literally, regions, countries, with functional democracy and civic culture. Uh, as opposed to cities, you might belong to clans, and clans are informal groups where, uh, that you rely on to solve your problems in your everyday life. And uh, clans could be parts of a nominal city, but in that case, clans ignore cities, clans disregard cities, clans view and perceive cities as something completely alien, completely detached, completely uncontrolled, which is kind of a fact of life. But if you want to resolve your problems, you do not use cities, you use <coughs> clans. So uh, uh, apparently the distinction between these two types of social capital that I just told you about is essentially a distinction between uh, clans and cities. Uh, all right. Uh, so why uh, clans can be harmful for development? Because clans, after all, uh, enable you to solve problems in your life. Why social capital, clannish social capital, could have a dark side? 
Well, very simply, the logic is quite clear, and uh, let me explain it to you in just a few words, and it's quite essential for what will follow. If uh, suppose that bureaucracy, uh, politicians, public servants <coughs> are not sufficiently accountable, bureaucracy is malfunctioning uh, because, of, uh, because of lack of political participation in society. And as a result, you see poor performance, you see corruption, you see uh, capture, abuse of power, so on and so forth. Uh, in every society, to some extent, politicians are sensitive to what is happening at the grassroots, even in the most dictatorial one. You should listen to the sounds from below. If you completely ignore these sounds, you're going to have serious problems down the road. But if people at the grassroots do not mind that you misbehave, if they find local solutions to problems caused by your lack of performance, then you don't feel much pain, you don't feel much heat from the bottom. And that gives you a sense of complacency that denies you whatever little incentives to perform you had before, that takes away the heat from government, and as a result, they invite further abuse. So this capacity to solve privately problems left by, uh, uh, unattended by government uh, further weakens the incentives for government officials to perform. And as a result, uh, there are two effects. One is direct effect, you fix that bridge. That's good. That's plus. But then there is an indirect effect. The municipal government of that uh, city of Sharia has even less incentive to take good care of the local infrastructure because it assumes that local business people will take care of that. And they will. But they also pay taxes. And these taxes are written on. They make no use of that money. And that, of course, gives uh, that, uh, uh, that, that sense of complacency to bureaucrats. So there is a, an indirect political effect. So the question is, which of these two effects, direct or indirect, is more powerful? Mm -hmm. And which of them prevails? If the direct effect uh, is stronger than the indirect one, then this horizontal capacity, this collective exit, is a good thing. If the indirect effect is stronger than the direct one, this exit is actually a bad thing. And our theory and our data show that uh, oftentimes the latter is true and the indirect effect is more powerful than the direct one. So it's, it's not a very good thing that societies take upon themselves problems left unattended by the government. Uh, okay, so this is what I already told you what social capital is. Uh, we discussed why social capital and governments could be substitutes or complements, and in fact they can be both as I said, so it's a combination of substitution and complementarity. Let me, let, let me spend just a minute on that slide. Uh, uh, for colleagues who are non-economists, you, you certainly heard that expression, public good. <coughs> but uh, and some of you who have taken some basic course in economics know the economic definition of public goods. But for those of you who have not or maybe have forgotten that, very simply, <coughs> public good is something that people uh, can consume jointly without actually crowding out each other. Uh, if I consume a piece of bread or a sandwich or whatnot, you cannot simultaneously consume the same piece of bread and sandwich, right? So it's private consumption. But if I consume clean air, or if I consume good highway, or if I consume police protection, or uh, if I consume uh, a very good uh, professional public TV channel, all of this is something that you can consume with me. So these are all public goods. And private economists, capitalist market economists, are very successful in delivering competitive private goods, much less successful in delivering public goods, uh, simply because it requires some coordination. And if everyone makes individual contributions to supporting a public good, <clears throat> then we'll probably not have enough of public good because of the free writing. You can access a public good irrespective, <coughs> by definition, as to whether you supported the delivery of that private good, public good or not. You are equally well protected by good police force if police force is funded by donations, irrespective of whether uh, you paid for funding this police force, or not, so on and so forth. And this is precisely why governments assume responsibilities for the delivery of public good. Private sector delivers public goods poorly. So governments assume that functions upon themselves, and they collect taxes, mandatory taxes, to fund these public goods. But then, uh, the point that I would like you to remember is that there is a very important public good that no government can deliver. 
and best public good that no government can deliver is efficient and accountable government. Efficient and accountable government is something that benefits all of us. And uh, it requires efforts and contributions to make government sufficient and accountable. It requires uh, taking parts in elections. It requires exercising your voice. It requires being politically engaged. Every once in a while, it requires taking part in protest actions. Uh, so it's costly to individuals. And uh, this is something that uh, also uh, affords free riding. But accountable governance, as opposed to all other kinds of public goods, is a public good that only society can deliver. <laughs> there is no super government that can give a, an efficient government as a public good. So some societies are more successful in ensuring government accountability because they have civic culture and others less so, and they resort to these private substitutes. They resort to exit rather than voice. I will skip this. Uh, I will skip that as well. Now here is a model, there are some formulas, so I'll, I'll skip it, but basically this is an attempt. This is what economists do most of the time. So if you want to produce a good paper in economics, ideally that paper should have a little bit of theory, and that theory, the reasoning, should be formal. Uh, and why people still need this formal reasoning? Because uh, it gives you an assurance that your assumptions, your uh, hypotheses, they are logically consistent. There is some logical way of explaining what you will ultimately bring to the data. So I'll skip that model for obvious reasons. It's still in, in the presentation, but uh, probably will make much sense to spend much time on that. But in this model, you have a description of a society which is endowed with two types of social capital. The first one is what I call civic culture, and this is the ability to hold governments accountable. And the second one is what was described as horizontal social capital, and this is the ability to fix problems for the government. And uh, it's an attempt to figure out how, uh, for different combinations of these two different types of social capital, how, the, the, how these two types of social capital affect two things. One is the performance of uh, governments, and the second <laughs> one is the social welfare. And uh, the conclusion is very simple. Civic culture is a great thing. Civil culture uh, improves the government performance, accountability, efficiency, and whatnot. And, uh, by, uh, and, uh, by making governments more accountable and more efficient, civic culture makes societies better off. Societies with high level of civic culture are more successful, more prosperous societies, are happier societies with, than those with uh, a lack of civic culture. As far as the second type of social capital is concerned, quite obviously uh, uh, this horizontal capacity, this collective exit so type social capital uh, 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 compromises the quality of governments. Uh, bureaucracies are less accountable. Bureaucracies, bureaucrats, and politicians have that sense that the problems that they might leave behind would be fixed by the society at the grassroots, and as a result, the quality of government suffers. And this is the indirect political effect of, of this capacity I mentioned before. But uh, uh, what is important is that uh, this horizontal social capital also has a positive direct effect, and the conclusion uh, that uh, we got uh, from this model, and this is not a trivial conclusion, so it's a good illustration of why models are helpful, is that the overall impact of this horizontal social capital depends on the level of civic culture. Uh, if there is almost no civic culture in the society, if there is uh, no hope to have governments accountable, in that case, this horizontal social capital is helpful because such societies got nothing to lose. Uh, the uh, performance of the government is already at the rock bottom. It can get worse. And as a result, you can, uh, you can provide some uh, horizontal uh, informal fixes. So it's better than nothing. If there is a high level of civic culture in the society, then governments are highly accountable. And uh, such capacity for horizontal adjustments to government failures is simply not required. It's idle. And as a result, the payoff to this horizontal social capital would be about zero. It's really not something that you need, because governments take good care of your needs. But in the middle, where you have some civic culture, not too much, uh, I mean, not enough to make governments fully accountable, but quite a bit of civic culture, in that case, the payoff to this horizontal social capital appears to be negative. And uh, in that case, you can say loosely that 
uh, exit type social capital crowds out civic culture and uh, it uh, further compromises the government performance and societies are worse off. Uh, here are some illustrations, but uh, not sure, maybe I, I can talk a little bit about this one. Uh, let's measure vertically uh, economic outcomes, social welfare, right? And let's measure horizontally around, along these axes different types of social capital. Uh, along this axis, let's measure civic culture. Don't ask me how you measure civic culture, it's irrelevant to this point. It's, it's metaphorical analysis, but it's an illustration of what I just told you. And along this axis, let's measure uh, uh, exit type social capital, horizontal social capital, as an alternative to government. So see what happens. Here, you have no civic culture. And as a result, if you have more of uh, horizontal social capital, social welfare rises. You see that, right? Uh, and this is what I said before, such societies have nothing to lose. Oh, well, yeah, about that time. Such societies have nothing to lose. And uh, as a result, if they can fix problems left and attended by the government, they're better off. Here is, uh, now, uh, here we have plenty of civic culture. Uh, governments are fully accountable. And then the payoff to horizontal social capital is zero. It changes nothing. But here, for example, we have quite a bit of civic culture. Governments are accountable, but not completely accountable. And here, a horizontal social capital makes you worse off. Welfare declines. So the overall payoff to uh, horizontal social capital is negative. And uh, what we did uh, finally was to bring this hypothesis to data. And this is already something which is empirical uh, and something which is real. It's not just uh, loose reasoning. The new survey data uh, is georating, georating survey, which was conducted countrywide uh, uh, seven, eight years ago. And here are some parameters. It was a major exercise, uh, 34,000 respondents, representative in uh, every Russian region, so on and so forth. And uh, uh, people were asked uh, about their norms, values, attitudes, about the satisfaction with the performance of their, uh, of their uh, local governments uh, and uh, how they would assess their quality of life. So we, uh, uh, we did factor analysis of survey data and we singled out two types of social capital. One is called bridging and another one is called bonding. So bridging social capital is a good proxy as we argued elsewhere for civic culture. Bonding social capital is something which is mobilized to power up this local subsidy, this alternative uh, to, uh, to government services. And what you do after that, you run several regressions. And the first thing you do is you see what contributions bridging social capital, civic culture, and bonding social capital, horizontal social capital, make to social welfare in Russian cities. And this is a city level analysis. And uh, you see that uh, the contribution of civic culture bridging social capital is strongly positive and highly statistically significant. So more civic among Russian cities are better off, considerably better off. Uh, whereas the contribution of bonding social capital, this horizontal adjustment, is clearly negative and also uh, uh, highly significant. So overall, the contribution for the whole uh, country the contribution of horizontal social capital, modern social capital to economic welfare is negative. So of these two effects that I mentioned to you, direct effect and indirect political effect, apparently the political effect is stronger. Uh, now, uh, quite obviously, uh, the main channel for uh, social capital to affect social welfare is the quality of governance. And uh, here you see regression results for the quality of governance as a function of two types of social capital. And you see that predictably, uh, civic culture bridging social capital has a very strong positive contribution to the quality of governance. And uh, horizontal bonding social capital makes a very strong negative contribution to the quality of governance. This is something that we suspect all the time, but it's still nice to see it confirmed by the data. And here are some scatter plots. Uh, vertically, and these are not unlike, excuse me, unlike this charts, which are results of computer simulation. This is real. This is real life. And in this real life, along the horizontal axis, you measure civic culture, open social capital. 
along the vertical line, you measure the quality of government. So these are Russian cities. And you see a clear cut positive correlation between the two. And this is uh, close social capital uh, uh, adjustments to government failures and the same quality of governance. Equally clear cut uh, her, her negative correlation. Now, uh, uh, this, is, this is something which I like a lot. Uh, 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 we argued that bridging social capital, civic culture is good for economic welfare, bonding social capital, horizontal exit type social capital is bad for economic welfare. We argue that both of them work for the quality of governance. So what happens if you include the quality of governance as an explanatory variable on its own in your analysis? And this is what we do here. And have a look at the first line. Quality of governance is extremely important for social welfare. Surprise, surprise. That's quite predictable, right? What is much less predictable is that in the shadow of the quality of governance, the contribution of bridging social capital, civic culture, disappears. So whatever contribution uh, civic culture makes to social welfare goes through the quality of governance. And once the quality of governance is factored in, on the top of the quality of governance, civic culture makes no contribution to economic welfare. And that's quite predictable. Interestingly enough, if you look at the bonding social capital and the collective exit, well, it turns out to be positive. Because once you've taken away, taken out the negative impact of bonding social capital on the quality of governance, there is still that positive side. <coughs> the direct effect, and you see it here, right here. Now, also, uh, we tested empirically the prediction of the theory that uh, if you have very little of civic culture, then um, uh, horizontal social capital collective exit is useful. And when you have quite a bit of civic culture, then it's harmful. And uh, uh, indeed, this is what happens to be the case. We divided our sample in three tertiles, three parts of about equal size. And uh, uh, the first, uh, and we divided it by the distribution of civic culture. So, uh, so for the bottom line, for the bottom third, uh, you might want to have a look here. For the bottom third, uh, these are Russian cities with almost no civic culture. And uh, the contribution of horizontal social capital is statistically insignificant. Positive and negative effects cancel off each other, basically. But when the level of civic culture increases in the Russian cities, the contribution of bonding social capital is growing increasingly negative. It's becoming increasingly a drag on social development because it crowds out civic culture. That's basically the story. Well, I'll skip that. Uh, and, and I guess I, I'm done. Sorry, it's taking a little bit more time. But uh, uh, there are some optimistic stories that in the course of economic development, strengthening of the middle class, uh, growing welfare, education levels, so on and so forth, you would expect that societies would accumulate some civic culture. Moreover, uh, there are also empirical uh, studies and theories that suggest that democratic experience builds up civic culture. So the longer is a period of democratic exposure of a society, the more of civic culture in that society. I uh, usually have on that. Uh, that supports a sanguine development view that civic culture accumulates more or less uh, spontaneously. It might take some time, it might take some patience and whatnot, but uh, if you are sufficiently patient, then ultimately you will have enough of civic culture and your democracy will finally start functioning properly. Well, our story suggests that it might be not necessarily the case. That there is a competition, there is some race against time between different types of cultures, different types of social capital, and if there is a prevalence of obsolete type of social capital, uh, that could hold societies back and it could disrupt this, uh, this virtuous circle of accumulation of, uh, uh, of civic culture. In fact, it could perpetuate a vicious circle whereby uh, uh, there is a perception of inevitable corruption, lawlessness, lawlessness government predation and so forth, uh, which would undermine trust in public institutions and democracy. It would also undermine trust among individuals. And that will give rise to this clannish mentality. And the societies will be, uh, for many years, if not decades and centuries to come, to rely on this clannish culture. Might be a good idea to conclude by bringing up again that story of, uh, of, uh, of Greif and 
and his co-author Stabilini, who said that there was a historical bifurcation in the development of the modern world, and that was a bifurcation between uh, Europe and China, whereby uh, Europe ultimately followed this city-ish path of development, and it became uh, an area of cities, of democracies, whereas China followed this clenched path of development, and that bifurcation occurred several hundred years ago. And um, successions of governments in China, imperial emperors, uh, communists, present governments, they do their best to get rid of clans, but it's still an uphill battle, and China remains a clannish society. And that's a serious restriction on Chinese development, despite of the spectacular economic growth that the country has developed. So this is a good illustration of, on the macro level of how different types of social capital can crowd out each other. And this is something which I think is, is uh, clearly present in today's Russia. And as a result, the overall direction of uh, cultural evolution of the Russian society uh, is somewhat up in the air. It could go different ways. And uh, if we want this, our country to be more modern, more uh, prosperous, more democratic, then uh, a great deal of attention has to be paid, not just to formal institutional reforms, but also at what is happening culturally, at what is happening, the norms, values, attitudes of the society, and whether uh, Russian plans are gradually, but hopefully steadily, being replaced by Russian cities. two questions if you'll permit me. Uh, first I was just wondering if you can, like what, what's the conclusion to the story with both Novosibirsk and Sharia? I mean was Sharia a case where it was rock bottom so that helped them and did they get their potholes filled in Novosibirsk? That's a simple one. The second one, the second question is, uh, so this story, like, I, I, I think I, I've, I've heard it before in a very different context. So I'm wondering, so you know there's a lot of uh, research on how in international development when foreign development agencies come in to a country and essentially <coughs> offer services for them, um, it impedes democratic development, like for, for exactly the same uh, mechanical reasons that you described. Okay. So I'm just curious if you could relate, uh, like to what extent do you engage in that literature, and do you see any differences between those two phenomena? No, well, to some, I guess, but it, it, it's, it's a valid parallel. Uh, which of these two cities is more successful, Novosibirsk or Sharia? I think Novosibirsk is. But not because beautiful girls in Novosibirsk <laughs> protest against uh, potholes of left and attended, although that's, that's a good thing to, to know. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but because, well, uh, I don't think Novosibirsk is unlike, uh, Prem and Novosibirsk share quite a bit with each other. These uh, big cities in eastern, or, well, I mean, east of Ural, so Ural's part of the city, uh, these are cities with solid cultural potential. Uh, uh, Novosibirsk, of course, is much younger than Perm. Novosibirsk uh, did not have such a rich history as Perm, but both cities' uh, developments were boosted during the Second World War as a result of this evacuation. I mean, uh, uh, institutions of culture, university, uh, industries moved, and, and they shared with the in common. And I think as a result, they, they, they're going to be more successful uh, than smaller places. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would not probably uh, draw any conclusions as to whether it helps Sharia to get that bridge field fixed. Uh, my hunch is it did. <laughs> and uh, one reason is that it might not necessarily be because of the local government was that bad, but simply because the local government simply didn't have money. So governance failures could not be at the lowest level. It had something to do with how the Russian public finance system is organized, as Barbara explained. That the, previous uh, presentation. But in general, for, for, for Russia-wide, we see very clear tendencies which are empirically supported, which are uh, based in data. And uh, those show that uh, there is a perception that democracy in Russia is suppressed, and this is a valid perception. There is a perception that elections are not very meaningful, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, apparently, there is something, or at least there was something up until 2007, that uh, made local governments, we're talking about city governments, about municipal governments, more sensitive, more accountable, more perceptive to what was happening at the grassroots, if there was a sense of the local officials and bureaucrats that societies are better prepared 
to demand that performance from governments. And this is something that we definitely saw in Luxembourg. I think this is something which we saw in Peru, and this is something which we see in some other places. An interesting question, by the way, is, and that brings us back to what I spoke about yesterday, uh, what explains these variations in the mixes of social capital between, uh, uh, between Russian uh, cities and towns? I don't have a clear explanation yet. And this is important in and of itself. This is also important to make our empirical story more sound. Someone spoke about instrumental variables. Uh, so we essentially look for instruments, for some fundamentals which explain these variations. And better these fundamentals be exogenous having little to do with what is happening now, rooted in history or geography and whatnot. There is one very promising uh, opportunity which are pursuing actually more or less as we speak to, well, something which is on the surface, it, if you may, it's not precisely what you asked, I'll get back to the second question in a moment, but it's, a, uh, it's important. Which cities are more successful? Uh, which cities, which parts of Russia are more civic? Northwest, that's clear. Uh, Archangel, uh, Novgorod, and, you know, and that's obviously historical. That has to do with, uh, with the split in the Russian church. That has to do with quite a number of other things. That has to do with the exposure to the, uh, to the modern cultural patterns, to the Western cultural patterns. I saw uh, an amazing article written by a Japanese grad student, and that article was about Russian illustrirovane journale. Uh, uh, in, in late 19th century, Russia was introduced to uh, journals, magazines. And this is something that was new for the Russian society, and there were three of them. There was Vakruk Sveta around the world, which is still around. It was Miba, and uh, there was something else. There were three, three major journals. <coughs> so she collected data on subscription to these journals nationwide. And there were four major concentration areas of subscribers to these journals. And guess what four they were? It's easy to, it's easy to, to, to name Moscow, two. Petersburg. It's a little bit more difficult, but also conceivable to name the third. Fourth comes the complete surprise. Novosibirsk? Well, Novosibirsk was not there. Ah. Novosibirsk is, uh, Novosibirsk appeared when the trans siberian Railway crossed the Upper yeah. and that was uh, about uh, 100 years ago. Not only in Europe. Europe? In Russia, well, yeah. Russian wide. Russian Empire. Ah, Russian okay. Empire. Russia was an empire at that time. Mm -hmm. Moscow is number one. Mm -hmm. St. Petersburg is number two. Clear, mm -hmm. right? Capitals, concentrations of intelligence, uh, bureaucracy. Kazan, maybe? No, 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 no. Odessa is number three. <laughs> Quite obviously. Mm -hmm. Also? <laughs> but what? No, what? Uh, Novosibirsk? Uh, I'm not sorry. I wish. Moscow, St. Petersburg, Odessa. And the third one, the fourth one was Northwest. The smaller places in the northwest, little towns, sometimes even big villages, they had plenty of subscribers to these journals. And that means that although there was no bureaucracy, not much economic activity, just the mindsets of the people that lived there were more liberal, more sort of modern than elsewhere in the country. Now the other places where we see more of local, more of social capital or civic culture in Russia are cities with good universities and also uh, academic paradox of different types. Uh, places where you had big uh, uh, scientific establishments, campuses. Also cities which are parts of the Soviet military industrial complex. Uh, Dvinsk, uh, where you have a lot of younger people, well-trained engineers, highly educated people that were brought together for whatever purpose, building a nuclear bomb purpose. But they brought with them uh, education, they brought with them civic attitudes. And as a result, these are more civic of Russian cities. But uh, we want to find, as I said, some more basic fundamental historical roots. And one very promising opportunity, which we explore pretty much as we speak, is to have a look at the serfdom. There are historians that have excellent data of the incidence of serfdom across the Russian Empire. And it appears that there were huge variations in the percentage of peasants that were serfs at the time of serfdom. Uh, in some areas, serfdom was nearly complete. Almost every peasant was serf. In some others, there were alternatives to serfdom. Some of those were free peasants, quite a few of them. Others were Kazonni, Christiani, state peasants. Others were uh, under some control of monasteries, but they were not serfs. They were free people. And, uh, and, and, and as far as I know, in this area, in the Urals, serfdom was not nearly as widespread as it was in Central Russia, in Southwestern Russia, and whatnot. 
So these variations can be actually successfully used to explain the current discrepancy in uh, social capital. It's still working for office, but I'm very hopeful about this. The second question, yes, of course, foreign assistance, foreign aid uh, provides these incentives, and many people complain about that, so it's a very valid parable. Uh, but I would like to take it a step further because uh, it's, you know, it's a buzzword of international development agencies to support civil societies, to support these local community initiatives, so on and so forth. And oftentimes they expect that these civil society initiatives take care of local development projects, local infrastructure, common pool resources, so on and so forth. So that may also be not a very productive thing to do. And it also diverts the energy of societies from becoming modern society, which requires political participation rather than the ability to, you know, fix uh, horizontally a local irrigation system. And one, one just to add to that, like one thing that might be interesting to you is um, the Pamir region in Tajikistan stands as a particularly extreme example of this because the Aga Khan Foundation provides everything. Like the government has almost no presence there. Right. Um, and there's been articles about how that's affected the sort of thing you're talking about. But like even compared to other countries that have high levels of international aid. It's an example of where the, the, the foreign entity is completely developing civil society and also just providing services. So. Well, Asim Oglan and Robinson produced recently a very interesting paper on Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had an excellent uh, uh, data set which explains variations of the quality of local governance in Sierra Leone in modern Sierra Leone. And all of local uh, communities are run and controlled by chiefs. And this is go back to the colonial times where the British recognized the authority of the chiefs. It was very British, in, you know, in its sense. You devolve, you devolve local governance to, to, you know, traditional systems of governance, and you're fine for as long as they are loyal to you. They pay taxes and they observe the gauge of your railroads. <laughs> you don't care much about anything else. And that system uh, sustained itself well into the independence period. Uh, but there are different types of competitions between different chief families. Uh, in different parts of Sierra Leone, it's historical. And the areas where more chief families compete for control over local communities, uh, such areas are more successful economically. You have better protection of property rights, their agriculture is more efficient, uh, literacy, health, what, whatever economic indicator you use, competition among chiefs is, is a good thing. And that's, again, that's something we would expect. But what came up as an unexpected outcome of that study was that uh, the level of social capital in localities is negatively correlated with the competition among the chiefs. So social capital actually is something that helps de facto to preserve political monopolies. And again, they point out that international development agencies' efforts to support local networks could backfire, could become too productive because this network can easily be captured by powers that be as a means to exercise more effective control over the societies so rather than as a means to hold local authorities more accountable to, to, to the public. Yeah, Barbara. Okay, yeah. Um, it was, you know, very thought-provoking, and, you know, it's also, you know, provoking, and I should, you know, probably start by saying that, um, you know, to, uh, as a Swabian, <laughs> this is deeply provocative, I, uh, or, you know, as a Catholic or Western European, I happen to come from a part of Germany that invented the so-called Kierwoche, uh, the sweeping, uh, well, literally the sweeping week, the sweeping regime, um, which um, consists of, you know, in houses, you know, people, you know, in apartments, you know, literally there is a sign that says, you know, the sweeping week, and it goes around, and every week a different family has it, and it means, you know, taking care of the common spaces. Okay. Um, and it's, you know, a deeply rooted institution that has made us the butt of jokes throughout the country, um, but it's also made us one of the, you know, tough, uh, the three net payers in German fiscal federalism. <laughs> so apparently it hasn't done the kind of damages <laughs> um, that you describe here. Um, uh, or you know, speaking more generally, um, um, you know, of course, you know, that whole part of the country um, operates on subsidiarity. So you know, the question is, you know, how does what you describe, you know, do you see all forms of subsidiarity as this type of negative social capital, or you know, what are the um, boundaries of your argument? Because you base it on a comparison of you know Russian regions, you know, fine, but you know, how far, you know, how does it operate outside? And, and your initial, you know, your lead up to this was very general, but I mean, plainly there are some specifics, and um, 
you know, I, I, I don't think it applies very well to patterns, you know, the, the, the typical Western European patterns were of subsidiarity and of delegation. It, it certainly does. It certainly does, and I have a sister study, which I can uh, describe here very quickly. <clears throat> now, going back to this idea of subsidiarity, the general perception, the general hunch, you know, uh, 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 intuition of subsidiarity is that you bring public matters down to the lowest possible level where you still can confine all the costs and benefits, right? So that's what subsidiarity is all about. And uh, all decentralization efforts in the modern world, uh, in Europe at the very least, or countries that follow the European path, were uh, inspired and driven by this idea, which is, which is excellent, right? Bring resources and powers to the people who would value them most, who would make the best use of those who would have the strongest incentives to use these resources properly, to customize the use of these resources to their local needs, and who would be better informed as to how to use these resources. So this is essentially the rationales in a nutshell for decentralization. This is what happened in Italy. Uh, in 1970s, Italy was put together by Haribadi as a very centralized state because it was needed from patches. It was a patchwork of different uh, jurisdictions. And it was a pretty bloody war that was fought and won to have Italy as the United States. So they were just about as paranoidal about uh, preventing decentralization as the present Ukrainian government is for about the same reason. So uh, decentralization, federalism was an F word in Italy for many years, up until uh, mid-1970s when there was a strong grassroots democratic pressure for, to, for Christ's sake, decentralize, because it's a diverse country. So decentralization followed and produced vastly different results, vastly different outcomes in the North. Decentralization was a resounding success, where northern provinces and cities uh, took full advantage of this uh, benefits of decentralization, subsidiarity, and whatnot, whereas in the South, these local uh, resources, powers, and uh, whatnot were captured by mafias. So there was an opportunity to make better use of these resources, but southern regions were probably better off at the centralized control, inefficient as it might have been, than under regional control, because they were unable to locally control government officials. At the national level, the whole country held governments more or less accountable politically. Uh, at the regional level, you rely on yourself. You are on your own. And if you do not have enough of civic culture, then this... And uh, getting closer to what Barbara asked, uh, we had, as I said, a similar study, which produced uh, strikingly similar results. But that study was not at the level of citizens. It was at the level of the apartment buildings. Uh, we studied Russian condominiums, Tessajet. As you know, and uh, the reform of condominium reform, it's a Russian version of condominium or strata council, what else you used to. And that's a great reform because apartment buildings were very poorly managed by local governments. And it's become proverbial that, you know, this management bodies uh, will be stopped by people who are drunk, corrupt, you know, absent from their jobs all the time. So. Let's put building management in the hands of people who live in these buildings. Let's give them the resources and let's give them the authority to use these resources. Let's them. Private ownership is great, right? Private ownership creates very powerful incentives to make use of assets. Yes, uh, unless this private ownership is public. <laughs> unless there is a community who has to exercise this public ownership uh, opportunities and rights. And therefore, in that case, a lot depends on uh, how civic is this community? If you live in an apartment building with 200, 400,000 other people, if you want uh, the management company or whoever takes care of your condominium to work efficiently, well, you have to do something about that. You have to attend meetings. You have to look through reports. You have to raise questions. If you see any problems, you have to raise their voice. More importantly, you have to make sure that uh, your fellow residents, tenants, apartment owners will do the same because on your own you won't be able to accomplish much. So what our empirical study showed was that even at the city, at the, at the building level, at the apartment building level, you can still distinguish between these two different types of social capital. There is some proxy of civic culture at the micro level, at the mini level, I should say. It's a, because this condominium is like a, a small republic. You have your own taxes, maintenance fees. You have your own executive bodies, you have your own parliament, which is the council on that apartment building. 
And if you can make democracy work, you will be able to make it work at the apartment building level. If you cannot make democracy work, your apartment building will not work either. And as a result, a good number, unfortunately, of uh, homeowners associations of Russian condominiums failed miserably. And they fell prey of all kinds of swindlers who pretend to deliver uh, management services. They call themselves management companies. But in fact, they uh, siphon money off that building and they abuse their control. They rent out uh, ground floors and attics and outer walls for commercials and all other kinds of shady things. And the owners get very little back. So uh, at the, going back to your question, even at this lowest level of the level of the apartment building, we still have this interplay between different types of social. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, you would probably assume that for a homeowners association for a condominium to work well, you need quite a bit of social capital among people in that kind of That's true. But what kind of social capital? Is it important that people know each other living in the same apartment building? Is it not that they help each other? Is it no? Is it important that they babysit each other's children, lend money each other? You know things that neighbors usually do. No, it appears it's not. What is important is that people are civically minded, that they attend meetings, that they uh, are able to reach a compromise, that they are able to, uh, you know, to effectively exercise their complete ownership rights, official ownership rights. If you have none of that, then condominiums break down metaphorically and sometimes even literally. And in those broken condominiums, this uh, primordial social capital, horizontal social capital helps, precisely as it did in the case of Russian cities, when there is no city culture, this horizontal capacity to solve problems is helpful when people have nothing to lose. But otherwise, it's, it's hard. Yeah, but then that's a, you know, now it becomes a more sophisticated argument, doesn't it? You know, because before you had you know, it sounded a bit like a, you know, bridging social capital and good, you know, bonding bad kind of thing, and, you know, comparing it. But, you know, now it sounds more like you're saying that, you know, there are certain preconditions, you know, also when you, you know, mentioned the Italian case, that, you know, when you have a pre-existing social capital in place, you know, then things work. So, I mean, that then, you know, because, you know, subsidiarity does, of course, you know, work in you know many countries where it's you know part of you know tradition and you know delegation right. to you know groups well, so, is it, so, so what i'm wondering is um, you know to what extent um, you could you know um, it would make sense for you to much more emphasize a you know more of a you know, political science of you know sequencing kind of argument um, because the case you're describing now you say is you know, you, you know it's a situation where you're starting from uh, uh, you know, it's an emerging order. It's uh, you know, you build it, and you know, if you bring in these things, um, um, you know, in you know this emerging process, you know, then they can prevent something else taking place, right? You know, they take the place of you know a more beneficial form of social capital. So I mean, you know, essentially, you know, I think you know you've got a sequencing type of argument. That you know maybe you should you know look at that, it that, you that know not be, just at you know doing these comparisons between you know different cases. That, 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 that might be a useful perspective. I agree, but uh, don't take more out of this study than it purported to deliver. Well, that's exactly. And, I'm, and, I'm trying and, to and, push and, the. And, and, and our mission was uh, rather modest, if you will. Uh, there is a problem uh, caused by um, dysfunctional government. And the government is dysfunctional because of the lack of accountability. And the lack of accountability is because the society is unable to hold governments properly accountable. <clears throat> but luckily, you think, the society can do something else. And it can, do, it can fix problems left. It can reduce the collateral damage caused, caused by non-performing government. This is a good thing. And the answer is not necessarily. Perhaps uh, we probably don't have much time, but let me if you do, I'd love to keep talking, but you stop me when we are out of time. Uh, uh, at the end, uh, the Russian part of the audience, and uh, maybe even the non-Russian part, might have heard of a great Russian writer uh, whose name uh, was Evgeny Schwartz. Uh, he is most famous by his plays. Uh, and uh, one of his most famous plays, <coughs> uh, almost all of them had hidden thoughts. <coughs> and don't forget the word written in the Soviet times, so uh, there was a lot of doublespeak at that time. 
and one of these plays is called uh, The Dragon, Dracon. And in that play, uh, uh, it's built uh, in a sort of uh, imagined imagine medieval town. And there is a German, I guess, uh, medieval, medieval town, which is well run, which is very efficient. There is uh, a mayor, burgomaster, and burgmaster, and, 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 and whatnot, so everything is fine. But the problem is there is a dragon nearby. And this dragon visits uh, the town every once in a while and collects what is due. Uh, and among other things, he collects a young girl to be sacrificed and, and some other supplies which are vital to the dragon. And people take that dragon as a fact of life. And they do nothing to fight that dragon. And, but they are, you know, people with a whole lot of social capital. So they prepare in advance everything that the dragon would require and they say, well, if he didn't do that, then the dragon would cause a lot of collateral damage. <laughs> the dragon will get pretty angry, <laughs> and he will still get uh, what he would need, but, you know, he would leave a whole lot of destruction around. So we minimize that damage, and we prepare, we deliver what we basically need to do. Not very different from these uh, entrepreneurs in the city of Sharia. And then there is a, a knight, uh, Sir Lancelot, and he takes upon himself to fight the dragon, and he doesn't get a whole lot of support <coughs> from the local residents. And they said, you know, well, you, you caused havoc in our life, and it was so nice, so orderly. Before you came, but, you know, we, we got used to living with the dragon, and that capacity to live with the dragon, and to take care horizontally in an orderly fashion, uh, what the dragon uh, has left behind is not such a good thing. So that was, I think, the hidden message of that. Of, of that play, and that's the lesson of that study as well. Uh, maybe you heard a brief question. Uh, um, again, I'm referring to a text I've been reading with my students, and uh, I'll try to briefly uh, summarize the message of the text. So, um, this was written by uh, William Reno, a scientist, I believe, and uh, he had tried to um, to use the shadow state concept, which is normally applied to, to Western Africa. Uh, um, in his interpretation of conditions in uh, Russia in the 1990s, and it turned out so that was not so uh, that was not the best model uh, to use. Um, but what was true for Russia in the 1990s was this idea that the state uh, would try to diminish uh, any kind of opportunities for free riders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to use to use services uh, which are provided by the state. Okay. So I I wonder how about these local governments you uh, you mentioned? Are they also trying to uh, reduce uh, these kind of services? And yes, no. What, no, what does no, it mean? No, that, you know, uh, again, speaking economically, you can uh, make access to public services fee based. You can ask people basically to pay for access to public services. And, you know, you see it in your life. You get some health care services free, you pay for the rest, and, and so on and so forth. And you pay for public transit, although you pay much less than is required to break even. There are heavy subsidies of public transportation. And as you probably know, in some uh, cities and some jurisdictions, uh, public transit is free. And I know three examples of such uh, situation. One is Seattle. Uh, in downtown Seattle, public transit is completely free. Buses, uh, you know, streetcars, whatnot. You pay only when you cross the boundaries of the city court. Another one is Edmonton in Canada, and the third one's in Tallinn, in Estonia. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense that it's a means to reduce congestion and to make public trans transportation an attractive alternative to using your cars. Uh, but otherwise, uh, making people paying for public goods and services is not a very good idea economically, because if it's a pure public good uh, and you do not use that public good uh, to full capacity, when you make people pay for it, you restrict their access to, uh, to this public good by the ability to pay. And from the point of view of social welfare, it makes no sense, because uh, you have to pay if you cause costs to the rest of the society. You have to compensate the society for this cost. If there is no external cost, it should be free. And therefore, ideally, economically efficiently, uh, access to public infrastructure should be made as much free as possible. But, uh, uh, but uh, there should be other ways to provide incentives for efficient provision of this public infrastructure. 
and that is to discipline governments, to, to hold government accountable. So, uh, fees for services is not a good substitute for conventional political accountability, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. And privatizing the delivery of services uh, has its clear limits. There is an interesting line in economic literature about the limits to outsourcing of private services, of public services. It's not about making people pay for public services, but uh, uh, governments can be considered as factories, as uh, firms that produce certain types of goods and services, but these services are public. And uh, every production, more often than not, is more efficient if it's conducted by a private firm rather than by bureaucracy because of the lack of accountability and whatnot. Again, references to Barbara's presentation would be quite appropriate at this point. So it doesn't mean that you have to outsource everything that governments do to private firms. In that case, governments will still pay for, for, for cover the cost of that provision, but services would be provided not by public servants, not by bureaucrats, but by uh, private firms who work on the contracts with the government. And in some cases, the answer is clearly yes. Municipal services, garbage collection, waste removal is something which is outsourced almost all over the world to private companies. But uh, in the case of some other services, it's not as clear cut. Uh, more controversial cases would be hospitals, schools. You see pros and cons of privatizing those. Police. Is it a good idea to outsource police services to a private company? But you can take it further. Is it a good idea to outsource military to private companies? Uh, perhaps uh, you want to outsource foreign affairs to a private firm, hire a contracting consulting firm. And this is what some big governments do. This is what the Georgian government tried to do. This is what the Ukrainian government somewhat tries to do by hiring top level executives from mm -hmm. elsewhere in the world. Is it, but more theoretical, I mean, from a normative perspective, is it good to you know uh, outsource foreign affairs to good consultancy or military to, you know, some uh, private uh, military company or whatnot? And the answer is uh, usually no. And somewhat, uh, somewhat less clear, some, some, a case which is in the middle is prisons. Is it a good idea to have private prisons? Uh, and again, you know, prisons are uh, costly, as we know, uh, and uh, these are public services. Uh, at, l at least two counts. They keep criminals, bad guys, check, you know, locked in. And at the same time, they also provide some public services to the inmates because you have to treat them humanely. You know, uh, the society should be secured, but other than that, the rights have to be preserved, so on and so forth. So is it true that a private company will do a better job, will deliver more for public funds than a state-owned prison, or do we want to have Butyrka Incorporated or Lubanka Limited or not Lubanka, Laboratory Limited uh, uh, or not, and, 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 and the answer is probably no. Uh, so it's not a very good idea to have private prison, but that's a separate story it takes us. Not least because you get the feedback with, for the policy making. You, 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 you saw that you know recent, I think, California discussion on this very topic you know, last week. Main problem, the, main problem, just, just to, to, to to, to very briefly summarize it, main problem with outsourcing public services is the ability to write a good contract, to explain and put in writing as to what you expect from the provider. And if this contract can be successfully written, if you can put on the paper pretty much all you need, and this is the case with uh, waste removal, do it on timely way, do it you know cleanly, do it uh, regularly, and so forth, go ahead. But in the case of prison, you probably want to demand some humane treatment of inmates. How that can be written down, and more importantly, how that can be enforced, that's a big question. And if you're skeptical, then uh, private prisons will be saving their payroll, and they will be much more cruel to inmates because it's a cheaper way to maintain order in prison. You could with a whole lot of wardens, but it's costly, and they will be watching the inmates all the time, or you can cut their force in half, and if there is some disorder, they will beaten up an inmate you know, to, to near death. And that would be the way to maintain order, but that's not what a good society wants. So, uh, powerful incentives to cut costs in the case of prison is not very good idea. Um, my question is a little bit different. I, I would like to come back to the nice options, voice against exit option. So, I'm not sure to what it may, perhaps my question might sound a little bit naive, but 
my contention is that a uh, political regime perhaps may um, put some restrictions on the possibility of using the exit options from time to time, as, uh, I mean, as we probably know from <coughs> the uh, social movement literature, that it's rather costly. So perhaps in your, I assume it was a game theoretical model, right, when you uh, developed it. Depends yeah, what you well, call game theory, but oh, yeah, well, okay, I guess, that's, that's yeah, you can call it a game theory. So, to some extent, so yeah. did I mean does it make any sense to consider the type of political regime the level of repressiveness, uh, so to speak? I'm not sure to what extent economists take political regimes seriously as an exogenous factor that may affect the uh, payoff the payoffs in this kind of games. So because um, this I mean the limits of this option is pretty much exogenously restricted. So yeah, well, uh, good point. Right. Well, I guess. Uh, you know, our analysis was for Russia, and uh, regimes are uh, the overall level of democracy or like thereof is more or less the same across the country. Uh, I think, uh, uh, of late at least, uh, it was clearly expressed that uh, government, the central government, uh, is not very uh, supportive of political NGOs, of, of the association or grassroots activities which uh, are voice oriented. But uh, they say we would we would love to see you guys exercising these uh, uh, exit uh, activities. In other words, we will happily fund uh, civil society organization which take care of local problems. We would be happy about that. So that was a clear, at least you know, rhetorical. I think that was a clear uh, expression of preferences. That said, however, when you speaking about voice and speaking about exit more generally, we have a similar study. Uh, not quite similar, but it's related to your question, not to the story that I said. Uh, we are trying to explain uh, visa regimes, variations across the world, and uh, why uh, in some countries people have better access to entering other countries than in other countries, right? I mean, uh, there, are, there are, for example, so-called international passport rankings. And passport ranking is the number of countries which a holder of a given passport can enter without a visa. So the highest passport ranking in the world, I guess, has Finland. And if you have a Finnish passport, you can, you're welcome in 175 countries around the world. And then it goes all the way down. In the case of Russia, the passport ranking is, I think, about 100. So it's still upper half. A Russian passport is very good. It enables you to travel. A good number of countries without the visa, so but they're not close to finish. And an interesting question is what explains these variations? Why is it that Finns are more welcome uh, around the world than, say, Georgians or Ukrainians, or for that matter, Russians? Ukraine is quite a bit below Russia, by the way, it's about 80 times whatnot. And I can talk about that if you're interested, it's an interesting story, but it just mentioned by way of what is more <coughs> related to your question is in a similar study. We want to uh, analyze the variations of exit costs. How difficult is it to exercise the ultimate exit option, that is to leave the country where you live. And these exit costs differ across the world. And unfortunately, we do not have very good data to measure exit costs. Uh, but a good, a rough proxy, a crude proxy, would be how much it's co it costs to get a foreign passport, to get a passport for international travel. It's not all of the exit costs because there are some other red tape things that you have to overcome. Uh, but uh, for lack like, of better option, <clears throat> this is something you can use. So uh, have a look at the cost of, uh, of the fee that people have to pay to get a foreign passport and see what percentage of GDP per capita uh, it comprises uh, for, for the given country. And it appears that the exit is easiest in very strong democracies which is understandable because it's a human right, you know, it's a political right to travel. So strong democracies respect human rights overall, and in particular they, they do not uh, mount excessive restrictions for those who want to leave the country. And guess what? Then you think that would increase uh, and would be negatively correlated to the level of uh, democracy. No, it's uh, inverted U-shaped. It peaks in the middle and it's fairly low for dictatorships. Uh, dictatorships, uh, by and large, let their people go <laughs> fairly easily. 
And uh, it doesn't make economic sense because dictatorships, who are the first to immigrate? Most energetic, most dissatisfied, most oh, okay. disappointed, yeah. those who would most, most likely exercise the voice option. So let's make it easier for these people. Let's give these people the exit option. <laughs> and, and it's a pragmatic choice. And again, if you have a look at the data, you see this parabola very, very clearly, very robust. So uh, I'm sure there are more uh, questions, but maybe let's ask these in uh, uh, a lunch break. So uh, we've had one hour of lunch break, and uh, we will now move over to uh, the director's result. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure, I think we have so, so few people.